Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Jason X, which premiered in Spain in 2001, but had its wide release in the U.S. in 2002. Throughout the 90s, Sean Cunningham was desperate to make Freddy vs. Jason. New Line Cinema poured millions of dollars into multiple screenplays from a dozen writers, but none of them were satisfactory, and by the end of the decade, they decided to make another Jason film. Cunningham put his son Noel in charge as producer, and they hired Todd Farmer to write a screenplay. Farmer suggested they put Jason in space, and by God, everyone agreed to do it. This is a terrific idea. Unlike Jason Goes to Hell, Jason X feels like a Friday the 13th. Sure, it's in space, with more action and sci-fi, but it's still a guy in a hockey mask killing lots of people in fun ways. It takes place far off in the future, where the fashion is remarkably 2000s, and people have stupid names. Rowan, this is Center on a Janessa. Kicker! Sven, Gecko. Stoney and Kinza. Thanks to Scream, the characters couldn't be clueless victims anymore, so Farmer took a cue from aliens and put them on the offense against Jason. And I have no regrets stealing from Jimmy Cameron because he got enough money, he did that Avatar thing. They're far from the traitless teens of early Fridays, and the cast commits entirely to the intentionally campy tone. Unfortunately, some of their dialogue is overbearing, with way too much of that Joss Whedon-style snappy snark. I'm bitchy as hell when I wake up. Did you just wake up? It'd be fine if one character spoke that way, but a lot of them do, and they all sound the same. It's been modified. Come on, you think? I used to love this movie, and now I think it's just okay. But when it comes to the kills, there's still plenty to love. Come with me and I'll show you. The movie begins in a fictional 2008 at the Crystal Lake Research Facility. Farmer set this in the future so it wouldn't mess up the timeline when they eventually made Freddy vs. Jason. Because, you know, wouldn't want the Friday timeline to not make sense. Jason Voorhees is being studied by Dr. Wimmer, who's played by director David freaking Cronenberg. It's nuts that I haven't covered any Cronenberg on the kill count, but if you want surreal sexy stories loaded with nasty body horror, get on that shit! Cronenberg's in Jason X as a favor to director Jim Isaac, who had done special effects work in several of Cronenberg's films. Sadly, Isaac passed away in 2012 of blood cancer. He was only 51. Rest in peace, man. Dr. Wimmer wants to know why Jason's so damn Jason-like. His unique ability to regenerate lost and damaged tissue, I mean, it just, it just cries out for more research. But fellow scientist Rowan says it's too dangerous to keep Jason alive, and she has a point. Somehow Jason has killed the guard watching him and chained him up in his place. Jason pops up to kill another four security guards with bludgeonings, using one guy as a bullet shield, and I guess breaking this dude's neck. Not quite finished, Jason tosses a spear through Wimmer's back. Cronenberg agreed to be in this movie only if he got to die. Consider that contract fulfilled. One last Jason and kill for this intro is Sergeant Marcus, who gets tossed through a door. J-Man really tore his way through that opener, huh? Rowan manages to shoot Jason into a cryo chamber, but as it starts the freezing process, he stabs her through the metal wall. This is why you don't skip on the cryo chamber material, folks. Sometimes quality costs. The two of them are cryo-frozen together, which is almost romantic in a weird kind of way. 445 years later, a bunch of Star Lords stumble upon the chamber. It's this Professor Low guy and his students on a field trip, and they're shocked at what they discovered. Discover. No one's seen a hockey mask in centuries. What's a hockey mask? Facial armor. Used in a sport outlawed in 2024. We've got three years until the Canadians riot. Enjoy the poutine while you can. The frozen Jason falls over and cuts off the arm of this Azrael kid, but this the future, motherfuckers. And the future's got the best drugs. The class also finds the frozen Rowan, and she's in decent condition. Unlike the Earth, a dead planet that's a desert hellscape now. Its satellites? Abandoned. Its surface? Brown and dirty. They shuttle their two specimens back to their spaceship, the Grendel, which has a metric buttload of people on board. Seriously, so many crew members and soldiers are here, but I'll just introduce them as they die. It's fine. Credit to the movie for giving most of them little moments or lines. Helps us learn that they exist ahead of their inevitable demises. They fix Azrael's arm using nanobots, son, restoring his physical integrity. They also use nanobots to cover Rowan and repair her at a microscopic level. Oh, sweet, and dress her in chainmail. Now she's ready to go jousting. What she's not ready for is finding out she's a time traveler. The year is 2455. Yeah, so like, everyone you know is dead. Sorry about that. Professor Lowe video chats his buddy in a bed. Why in that bed, bud? I can't. Move. Oh, okay. Creepy Skype guy Dieter here is played by Robert A. Silverman, a Cronenberg regular who was also in Prom Night, which is great. He figures out that the big boy body on board is Jason Voorhees. I killed nearly 
200 people and simply disappeared without a trace. That's a valuable discovery, which is convenient for Professor Lowe. I need money. He also needs his nipples tweaked, apparently, because that's what student Janessa does to ensure she passes her midterm. You pass! <laughs> what the fuck? Comedy was always going to be a part of the Jason in Space movie, but the filmmakers had disagreements over the movie's tone and type of humor. Director Jim Isaac wanted something scarier and weirder. The nipple clamping scene was of his flavor. Writer Todd Farmer wanted the humor to come through action, while Sean Cunningham had his own ideas. Despite claiming he'd be hands off, Cunningham kept having uncredited rewrites done, all the way into rehearsals, which upset director Isaac. As we got closer into shooting, uh, the script got changed. John Vorhaus did a pass, as did Louis Abernathy, who you might know from his on-screen appearance in Titanic. Abernathy added a lot of the jokes that Farmer called hokey, like he's screwed. The campy tone helped with the ratings board, at least. The MPAA was surprisingly lenient towards Jason X. Professor Lowe has an intern, Adrian, named after Friday's OG final girl, Adrian King. He puts her in charge of Jason's body, and she's not scared off by his greasy, goopy black blood. In fact, Adrian's downright sympathetic towards the zombie man. Child. Oh, poor baby. No wonder you wore this thing. Elsewhere on the ship, some kids are getting horny, which is exactly what the J-Man needs to stir him back to life. Yeah, Jason's always killed sexually active teens, but now we learn the truth. Orgasms are his alarm clock. <sighs> Jason grabs Adrian and manhandles her, with actor Christy Angus doing her own stunt here. Angus said that despite the physicality of this scene, she always felt safe working with Kane Hodder. <laughs> I wish we had more of her character in this film, but at least she goes out with one of my all-time favorite kills. Jason dips her face into liquid nitrogen, and after it freezes, smashes it to bits on the countertop. Motherfucking flawless. Welcome to the future, Mr. Voorhees! While you're here, may I interest you in our line of future weapons? Ah yes, the future machete. Fits you perfectly, my man. Everyone knew the liquid nitrogen death would be a highlight of the film, which is why they prepped the hell out of it, making ten fake heads that all ended up being used. The kill was even even featured on Mythbusters, where they determined that, while awesome, it's not a realistic depiction of what would happen. The Grendel is on its way to Earth 2, the replacement planet for humans since they went and fucked up the first one. Rowan meets a bunch of people, learns that Jason was brought aboard, then finds out he's up and killing people again, cause he just loves killing. Oh boy, here he goes killing again! He stabs horny guy Stoney in front of his girlfriend Kinza and threads the machete through his torso. Then Stoney gets dragged away so he can go become an Italian pop star. Kinza runs to the others and gives her version of Chili's acting from part three. Stoney's dead. Oh my god. Stoney's dead. No, really, was that an intentional reference? Chili's dead! Sergeant Brodsky, certified space badass, puts the ship on lockdown and says he's gonna kill Jason, regardless of how valuable he might be to Professor Lowe. My only consideration is the safety of the people on this ship. Hell yeah, love the nobility Peter Mensa brings to this role. In the hologram section of the Grendel, a couple of dudes play a VR game with crappy looking CG aliens. It's Azriel, the doofus who lost his arm earlier, and Dallas, a stone cold looking soldier played by writer Todd Farmer. Also playing their game is Jason, and that guy is going for the high score. He might just get it too. Jason's one of the natural gamers. Okay, screw this game over. The room reverts to its depressing dark reality, and Jason brings his murdering to the real world. First, he kills Azriel by breaking the kid's back across his knee. Quick, simple, brutal. I like it. It also might be a reference to this Batman story arc, which involved a character named Azriel and Batman getting his back broken by Bane in a similar way. Jason then kills the man who wrote this screenplay when he crushes Dallas's head until it squeaks. <laughs> Despite the digital nature of this scene, it still required awesome stunt performers. Asriel's double, Allison Reed, took a bump on the cement floor. She hits the ground, and she hits the ground dead. I mean, there's no protector face, there's nothing. She just hits dead. Todd Farmer wanted to do his own stunt, but Kane Hodder said hell to the no. Good thing he did, because Farmer's stunt double broke his nose in this shot. I believe Farmer's double was Kevin Rushton, who was in the first trap scene of Saw 4. Sergeant Brodsky tells his grunts to arm up for a Jason hunt, and he wants them to bring out the big guns. You got a BFG? 
do with me. The BFG is a reference to one of my formulative video games, Doom. The big fucking gun was the biggest, baddest weapon in the game. They head out on a Jason hunt in the most boring sequence of the film. It's just close-ups of people with stupid names walking around with guns. A slow-moving aliens knockoff until they get killed off one by one. The first one killed is someone with a normal name, Sven. Jason solid snakes him into a hallway and kills him with a very uncharacteristic neck snap. What are you, J-Man? Leppy boy in his first two films? BFG Toad and Condor fares a little better with some bicycle kicks, but Jason kills him by knocking him onto a giant screw sticking out of the floor. Gotta watch those giant floor screws, man. Otherwise, you'll be subjected to shitty puns. What's his condition? He's screwed. Next up is Gecko, who could use some neck insurance, since Jason appears behind her and slits it off screen. Huh, what's worse, living on the Grendel or living in Gilead? She's found by Kicker, who Jason kills by swiping in half off screen. Hmm, I guess that guy's gonna have to change his name to Puncher. Am I right? He ain't got no legs. Finally, a grunt named Briggs swings into Brodsky's face on a spiky chandelier, or possibly a space anchor. With all his grunts dead, Brodsky's the lone remaining soldier. Jason doesn't waste any time getting stabby stabby. It's gonna take more than a poke in the ribs to put down this old dog. Oh. Yeah. That ought to do it. Man, I love Brodsky. The civilians are stranded on the Grendel's bridge, which looks like something out of a cable TV show. Jason X had a budget of $13 million, more than the last four Fridays combined, but that still wasn't enough to make a proper sci-fi action film. Especially not with early ideas like Jim Isaac's zero-gravity party scene. To save money, they used a first-of-its-kind digitizing technique and filmed everything in a warehouse in Toronto, Ontario. The only shot done outside was when they're leaving Earth-1, and it's hilarious is to see it without the effects. I think the spaceship sets look cheap, too brightly lit and colorful, but otherwise, Jason X's effects are pretty well done for the money they had. A lot of the kills use a really nice blend of practical and digital effects. Props to them. The Grendel approaches a space station called Solaris thanks to the efforts of Pilot Lou. He's a cowboy kind of guy who's sometimes desperate, sometimes funny, and sometimes both. <laughs> So lonely. He is also sometimes dead, like now. Jason comes from behind and slashes him to death off screen. With the pilot dead, the Grendel doesn't stop to dock at Solaris. Instead, it scrapes the space sunroof and goes straight through a tower. Holy shit. This is another instance where they combine digital and practical effects. I love this shot of them crashing these real life models together. It's awesome. The Grendel proves somewhat indestructible, but the Solaris on the other hand, eh, not so much. And here's the deal for the kill count. I know writer Todd Farmer said it a Q&A one time that 20,000 people died in this explosion. But I'm not gonna put 20,000 on the kill count. That'd be dumb. I'll level with you though and count kills we can reasonably believe took place. First, that Dieter guy, since he was on the Solaris when Lowe called him. Later, Lowe mentions that there are soldiers stationed there ready to help them. They have 60 highly trained professionals standing by to get us off this ship. And finally, I hear someone trying to communicate with the Grendel through the comm system. So I'll put 62 on the kill count for this giant space station explosion. A far cry from 20,000, but still plenty more than Jason's other adventures. No matter how big a number I give him though, Jason always wants to kill some more. He chases the ship's survivors off the bridge and through the crappy looking space hallways. Well, most of the survivors, Professor Lowe is left behind with a Jason yearning for his old reliable. Guys! It's okay, he just wanted his machete back! Professor Lowe is killed off screen with a yell that echoes through the tunnels. The survivors are narrowed down enough now for me to name them all, so here. Our final girl from the past is Rowan. You already know her. These two students are Janessa and Kinza. Janessa has a lot of the annoying dialogue clearly written to be in the trailers. I don't think he's out there. Why don't you just... Stick your head out and have a peek. Kinza is still traumatized because her boyfriend with a stupid name got killed in front of her. The older guy is the ship's engineer Crutch, who almost definitely grows weed in his workshop. And there's also nerdy student Sunaran and the sexy android lady he built named KM-14. It isn't like that. Oh really, dude? Cause you gave her nipples, man. I mean, I know she said she wanted them, but like, who programmed her OS, you know? Finally, there's Waylander, the ship's kinda tech guy, I don't know. They're all played by Canadian actors. Some of whom would go on to do more sci-fi. In fact, Rowan's actor Lexa Doig played the titular android in Andromeda, co-starring alongside Lisa Ryder, who plays an android here, but a human in that show. Swapsies is split up to do separate tasks. Sonarin's is to tongue fuck his robot lady. It isn't like that. Oh what? Sorry brah, can't hear you over that synthetic spit swapping. After arming herself, Rowan finds Sergeant Brodsky injured but still alive. Cause if you want to get rid of this guy for good, you'd have to kick him into a bottomless pit. In the bridge, 
Crutch and Waylander find the remnants of Captain Lou as they attempt to use the Grendel sh- Wait, I'm sorry, Waylander? What the fuck are you wearing, man? A furry sleeveless vest and a shotgun shell necklace? What? You know what, though? You do you, man. He leaves the bridge to show Rowan his drip, and while he's gone, Jason shows up with Professor Lowe's head. Jason kills Crutch with a space version of the Voorhees special, frying him in electrical shit. A classic, even in space. This is all way too much for Kinza, who's on the shuttle, but who won't open the door for anyone else. <laughs> Rowan, what was that stop? You looked like a cartoon character hitting the brakes. <laughs> Kinza tries piloting the shuttle herself, but, uh, yeah, it doesn't go very well. I think maybe you should get certified before you try again, Kin Kin. Then again, blowing up might be better than listening to more of Janessa's dialogue. Now what? Um, now basically we, we die. These three are saved from Jason by Sonarin and his sex bot. Now with the latest dominatrix patch. Gave her an upload. Wait, an upload? You mean you gave her an upgrade? Or do you mean you gave her the old upload download in out in out? Know what I'm saying? <laughs> KM shoots the shit out of Jason in a scene I can't decide how I feel about. It's cheesy as hell and overwrought. And yes, I know it's trying to be, but I'm still not sure if I like it. Still not sure if I don't either. I'll count Jason as a kill here because I think it's it's gotta technically count. I mean, she uses a giant gun to blow his frickin' head apart. As a final insult, KM sticks Jason's machete in his chest. Who's your mom? Actually, Sonarin made you, so you're more like his daughter. Wait, ew. The survivors patch up Brodsky and react hilariously to the ship's lurches. The Grendel is on its way to blowing up. Wait, show me Janessa's little stumble again. Yeah. Another ship called the Tiamed is coming to save them, but to survive long enough to get that rescue, they'll have to make some modifications to the ship. Hey, maybe start with turning off the nanobots, bad, cause turns out that's where Jason's body landed, and now this senseless scanner is spitting out nanobots to reconstitute the J-Man. Since he doesn't have enough tissue left to heal, the computer decides to fix him up with synthetics. Thanks, computer! That gives us this chonky big boy named Uber Jason. He's been modified. Shut up, Janessa! Yes, Jason has gotten a sci-fi makeover that I kinda like. They're having fun with it. The Uber Jason suit was partly inspired by Maria from Metropolis. It was designed by Stefan Dupuis, who also designed the freaking Robocop prosthetics, and who won an Oscar for his effects work in Cronenberg's The Fly. The suit itself was made of foam pieces, carbon Kevlar, silicone, and leather all blended together. It only took 15 minutes to get in and out of thanks to two long zippers on the side, but it proved more rigid than normal Jason prosthetics, and Hodder said it constricted his movements. They're starting to build bumpers for cars out of exactly the same process. Still, I think it looks awesome, especially those red contacts that Kane Hodder's wearing. It ended up being so effective in person, he would scare people around the production office. With Jason more indestructible than ever, KM don't stand a chance. Jason punches her head right off. Sonoran's all like, ah, ah, I can still use this though. Everyone escapes through a hatch, except for Waylander, who sacrifices himself in an attempt to take down Jason. He dead Detonates a bunch of explosives they had planted to sever an unstable part of the Grendel. Jason survives and punches a hole in the hull that creates a pressure problem. While most of the survivors are able to get to safety, Janessa's left behind hanging by the tips of her gold fingers. Unfortunately, she's unable to die without one last shitty line. This sucks on so many levels! It certainly does, Janessa. Including the fact that the gore here looks like plastic pieces of bacon. With Jason as perseverant as ever, the remaining survivors run away. Rowan, Brodsky, and Sonarin looking like Al Snow as he carries around KM's severed head. What does everybody want? That Tiamat ship gets there and sticks his piece into the Grendel so these folks can have a sexy evacuation. Some technical issues force Brodsky to take a spacewalk outside. To buy everyone time while he fixes things, Sonarin and KM's head whip up a digital diversion for Jason Voorhees. It's a virtual Camp Crystal Lake in one of the crowd-pleasing scenes of the film. I remember the theater going nuts at this part with its throwback setting and score. All that's needed are some throwback sexy teens. Sonarin quickly creates those to keep Jason busy. Hey, you want a beer? Or do you want to smoke some pot? Or we can have premarital sex. Jason is indeed interested, but only in killing them in a riff on his famous sleeping bag kill. And yes, I'm counting these women, even though they're not real. They're digital people experiencing digital deaths. I don't know, man. It makes sense to me. Brodsky fixes their issues, allowing Rowan and Sonarin to board the Tiamat. Oh, don't forget KM's head, Rowan. I told you, it's what everybody wants. Jason tries to follow them, but he's stopped by Brodsky, looking like a badass and ready to have a badass battle. Three, two, one, let's jam. Jason must be some kind of tank, because even after the Grendel explodes, he starts heading towards the Tiamat. He's intercepted by Brodsky, somehow controlling his movement without any propellants, which saves the other survivors, but sadly doesn't save this script for more shitty lines. I'll be back on my feet in no time. 
as soon as I have some. Blech. Brodsky perishes while riding Jason like a meat shield through the atmosphere of Earth 2. And don't call this madness. This is sci-fi! They become a shooting star and land in a lake by some horny teens. But I won't count Jason as a kill here, cause I don't know man, he's all Uber and shit. The movie ends with what's technically the last shot in the Jason timeline. Uber Jason's mask sinking to the bottom of the lake. How many kills did Jason get when he reached for the stars? Let's find out and oh my god, who set off the cryo chamber? Ah! This time around, I counted 88 kills in Jason X. That included 21 dudes, 7 ladies, and 60 unknown soldiers stationed on the Solaris. Did my counting style satisfy anyone, or do you still want the 20,000 kills? Too bad! With a runtime of 91 minutes, that left us with a kill on average just about every minute. I'll give the golden ch- I mean, it's the liquid nitrogen face smash. You know it, I know it, we all know this thing's the golden chainsaw. It's one of the best kills of all time. The almost shanty for lamest kill will go to Sven, who Jason killed with a stealthy neck snap. And that's it. Jason X was filmed in 2000, but during production, New Line's president Mike DeLuca was fired. DeLuca had been the movie's point person at the studio, and since his replacements didn't care about Jason X, it sat unreleased for 18 months. During that time, a bootleg got out on P2P programs. For a while, we were the most bootlegged, downloaded, bit-torrented, um, film. When it finally was released, sandwiched between the Scorpion King and Spider-Man, Jason X bombed at the box office. It remains the lowest grossing Friday film domestically. Next week is the main event, Freddy vs. Jason. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Well, the next Kill Count. Are you a citizen of City 10 who's looking for a job? I don't know. Join the Metro Police Department and keep your fellow citizens safe. You're gonna learn to be a team player. The Metro PD is always first on the scene whenever anything suspicious arises. Like a jigsaw copycat killer or, you know, maybe a little pig puppet. That shit's weird. What are you saying? Nothing. So, we're here to check it out. I've been staring at this shit for five hours. I don't even look at porn that long. Benefits of the Metro PD include a front row ticket to Chris Rock practicing his stand-up routine. Who the fuck is nicer than Forrest Gump? He did everything for Jen, and she still wouldn't fuck him. You'll also occasionally receive gifts from anonymous thankful citizens. Is that a fucking tongue? Yeah, you might get stuck in a death trap or two, but heck, at least you'll be in most of Spiral from the Book of Saw. Cause this whole damn movie's a police procedural that doesn't even want to be known as a Saw movie. Ah, uh, somebody watched The Wire. It's from the Book of Saw. It's different. Sorry, hit it. But it's still got a lot of bloody Saw traps. I don't know. You'll understand more by watching Spiral from the Book of Saw this weekend. And on Sunday, that's in just two days, you jerk. Can't wait. Tune into dead meat for the kill count. Jigsaw copycat. That could be difficult. Spiral from the Book of Saw can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Demi always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before it's kill count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this kill count. I want to thank some patrons like Dane Otto, Lucinda Hayes, Rach, Thomas Mortel, Jonathan Jaramillo, Bob Driller, and Seth and Hughes. Are you ready for an actual relook at Freddy vs. Jason? Not the Nightmare Special Edition kill count, which was basically the same as the Friday one. This one's all new, baby. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.